Hello and welcome everybody. This is Jen Cruz from the She Squatchers and I have a very special thing for you today. I've got Mel Scahan from the Yakima Nation on with me today and we're going to be talking about some Bigfoot encounters that uh, that he's been having up in the Yakima Nation in Washington. Um, and he works with the forestry department. Is that right, Mel? Yes, yes, I've, I've been employed with the Yakima Nation Forestry Program for, this, I'm going on my 26th year now. Very cool, very cool. And so you're out in the forest out there in in Washington, and you, you have a lot of Bigfoot up there, I hear. Yes, yes, we do. And when you have pretty close to 15,000 enrolled members running around a muck on the Yakima Reservation, you people tend to run into them. And the, the Yakima Reservation is about 1.225 million acres. So we have wow. a big area for them to roam. Wow, that's a huge reservation. Yes, and you know the best part of it? What I, it took me, it didn't, well, it took a little while to figure this out, is that I'm the only one that really collects all the Bigfoot reports on the Yakima Reservation. And when I, when I started out, I didn't know what was going on out here. And um, so I sought outside help. And then after... You know, getting the familiarity with all the stories and encounters that I was having with everybody else. And I realized, hey, I've got 1.25 million acres all to myself with nobody else running around and trying to do anything. So I had a, I was alone out there. Oh, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. And you have a closed reservation there too, don't you? Yes, yes, we have a, a closed area, and then we also have what we call a primitive area where there's no no activity. What the, most people are used to hearing is a, a wilderness portion where there's no motor vehicles or um, structures allowed. Very neat, very neat. Well, I know um, my family comes from the Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota, and we have a closed reservation in Non-tribal members are not supposed to just get out of their car and walk into the woods or off into the areas without a tribal member with them. And do you have the similar rules there? Right. Yes, yes, yes we do. And we also, if we have visitors coming in uh, that are non-enrolled uh, that want to go for a drive, and uh, we can apply for a permit for the day or for the week, and then you know, as long as as long as we don't do any uh, collecting or any hunting, then then everything is going to be good. All right. Wanted to make that clear for everybody before you start telling them all these amazing things. You don't want a bunch of non-reservation people showing up to go bigfooting on your land. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I've been asked plenty of times, and you know, we border up right against. I see Mount Adams is on the southwest portion of the Yakima Reservation, and. Um, Go north of there to the Goat Rocks if if anybody wants to look this up, and then you'll see where the Yakima Reservation borders the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. So if you walk that line right there at the boundary, I guarantee you, you know, this is close as you can go onto the reservation, but you can still have activity. Ah, okay, good. That'll be nice for the locals out there to figure that out. That'll be nice. Yeah. So before we started recording, you just told me the most amazing story. <laughs> and um, I was like, yeah. dang it. <laughs> I wish you would have told me that you were going to tell me a story. I would have started recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah I thought please... we were recording. I'm, I'm new to Snap or what? what, what is this? Skype? We're using Skype. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then I'll upload it to our YouTube channel later, uh, later today. Okay. So, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty low tech. I don't do any editing. So whatever you say is going to be on there. So. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, well, yeah. if I start sweating and my makeup starts running, then I'm going to be in trouble. Oh, you did a perfect job on your makeup and your hair today. <laughs> 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 wonderful, wonderful. So will you please tell me that story again so that the listeners can hear it? Because that was just an amazing story about about the fire, the fire, the fire tower. Yes, yes. Um, a few years ago, we, well, the Yakima Reservation has uh, two manned fire uh, lookouts, and they're roughly about 25 miles apart from each other. 
and then once they're located in the central, so you know you get plain view of of everything in sight. So they have about a thirty five mile radius of a visual that they can look out on the reservation. And uh, the one that's deep into the uh, uh, closed area is called the Signal Peak Fire Lookout. And this this particular fire lookout as um as the tower is about forty five feet tall and it also has a cabin. And the, the cabin is a one-room cabin. It's got a kitchen and it's got a living room area. And what's unique about it is, is that it's not plumbed for water or for electricity. So everything is candle or flashlight that they bring up. And um, they also get dropped off during their work week so that uh, they don't want them taking off their job is specifically to protect the Yakima reservation for for any wildland fires and during this summer they had a, a lady and uh, this lady she was told by her family members after after we had interviewed her and everything she was told by her family members that you're going to see bigfoot while you're up there and then she was like you know no 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 whatever and I uh, said, no, 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 you're going to see Bigfoot while you're up there. said, so <clears throat> she starts her job and, um, you know, ordinary, ordinary times up there of, of looking around, being all day up in the tower and then coming back down for, to sleep down in the cabin and everything. She would, she would witness bears walking down by the cabin, cougars and elk and you know, all, all that wildlife and everything walking about down below. And but n nothing out of the ordinary for her. And a strange thing started happening to uh, she would hear vocalizations, weird howls and whoops. And I don't remember her saying anything about wood knocking, but during the evening hours, she would hear that coming from the south. And you know, she didn't know what to think of it and everything. And um, but as the time had progressed and they get, were getting closer to the cabin, they would walk by the cabin. She would sleep with the window open in the bedroom and she would pick up this horrific smell that was putrid, pungent, and just you know, didn't know what it was. And then it would go away. But then in the evening hours, then it would come back and it would show up again. She was not reporting a lot of this to anybody other than the person that would pick her up and then drop her off. So she'd get pick up, picked up at the end of her work week and then two or three days off and then go back up. And then they started seeing impressions, uh, prints around the cabin. And uh, they, would, they were walking around the cabin and then walking around the tower was what they, they had seen. And then they would... Um, dust the tracks so that nobody else would see them. And then one time she had made the comment, she goes, well, I would like to see that big man with the big feet. And when I say something that like that, that bold out in the woods, then something is bound to come true about that because we're never, we're never supposed to talk like that. We're out in the woods. And um, so <clears throat> She goes back down, she comes back up, and then she um, does her work week, smells, howls, whoops. She's getting the whole effect, and they're getting closer, and it's getting more frequent for her. And when she gets picked up uh, the last time from her, her work week, uh, the, the grass on the front was getting tall and so she made the comment so, well I need some I wish somebody would pull my pull my weeds for me and she goes down spends her three days and then the lady picks her up and takes her back up and they come back up and what they notice are the footprints again and then they notice that her grass has been pulled all the way around the cabin and put right there bunched up in front of the steps and then she had asked has anybody been up here to do this and uh, she said, no, nobody's been up here. Uh, they didn't man it this weekend because of the weather. And uh, so who pulled, who pulled the grass? The guy, 
the, the people with the big feet or, or well, who did it. So she's just like floored. And um, she also would feed an elk that would come around. She placed an apple out on the porch on the east side. Is uh, one day she opened the opened the blinds, and then there was this big bull elk that was standing right there in front of the window, and it just it freaked her out to see something that close. And so after that, she started putting apples out for it, and then the apples would start being taken. And her last day that she was up there, it was right around seven thirty, almost eight o'clock in the morning, and she could hear shuffling going around outside on the gravel in front of the cabin and this she assumed was her elk and so she goes well he scared me once before a couple times before well i'm gonna get him back so she goes over to the blinds and she pops open the blinds like that and then right less than 15 feet in front of her was this large dark tall figure that uh, had hair that was right around three inches long Hair was dark, kind of peppered with uh, white and silver, cracked skin, um, eyes that were dark with no whites, and um, a sagittal crest, cracked skin, dirty black fingernails, and, and this, as his hands were down by his side, his hands were cupped, kept them like this, she said. Maybe you never had them open. He, all, the whole time, his hands were cupped right next to him, and then she could see how dirty his uh, fingernails were and um, kind of patchy and blotchy depending on where on the body she was looking the hair wasn't consistent all the way through like it had been pulled or you know scarred or whatever and this when she popped open the blinds he was looking up and then after a bit when saw movement and everything then he focused his attention right at the window at her and she froze because she knew what she was looking at she couldn't speak she couldn't scream and she was like nailed to the floor and she wanted to scream and everything and she wanted to run away but she couldn't so here these two are looking right at each other and, and that's they, he didn't do anything they just they just stared at one another and it was right around five minutes. Then he um, raised his right arm and then she goes, when he raised his right arm, he raised it up a couple of times and shook his hand. And then he went, bah, bah. and then he turned to his left and then he started walking away from him. And then as he was walking away, you know, she could see his hind end and everything as he was moving away and everything. And um, it was when he got out of view that she was able to get her body back. And then basically after that, she ran into the back room and then she waited for she was waiting for this thing to go away or she didn't know what was going to happen next. And then she remembered that she forgot her her work radio, the two way communication radio in the living room. So she was like, oh, I need to go get it. And then she went running after it and then went from running fast back in there and closed the door and made a call and said that she needed somebody up there. And then at that time, we had a, we had a contract with a helicopter. And then they would go fly the reservation in the morning for looking for any spot fires, smokes. And they had heard, they heard her traffic on the radio and then they came over to where she was and did a couple of things, a couple of fly arounds around the place. And, and then they took off and then it took about, it takes about two and a half hours to get there. So somebody was on their way. And so after all of this, she was gone for about three weeks and they, she wanted to go back up, but they, they wouldn't allow anybody else to go back up there. And then, we finally were able to interview her and get all these details that I was describing to you. And then one thing that stood out about the whole, this whole thing was when we were doing the measurements of the trackway that he had left behind and he was a male, she could tell he was a male. And, um, she goes, when you guys were following and tracking it, did you guys notice something about the way he walked? 
And then he's like, yeah, what, what's going on? She goes, well, when he turned to walk away, he had a, a severe limp to him. He would plant his left foot, but then he would swing his right leg out and he wouldn't put a lot of weight on plant his left. And, and then, and so that's what we noticed while we were tracking it. We were finding a solid left, but we could not find a, a, a good print for the right side. So we were trying to figure out what was going on here. Was he hopping as he was leaving or what was going on? And now it made sense as we, when we interviewed her that, you know, he had a problem with his leg. And then as we followed him, there was a four foot cliff that he jumped off and then landed 12 feet down below that. And then the, you could see where his, both his feet had hit and then stopped. And then he turned to the north and then he, the way he went, that's when we uh, stopped following him. But what she didn't see were the other two that were in the area. There was an 18 inch track. And then there was a 14 inch track. So while she was right, right here staring at this one, the other two were off to the south, southwest. And then we found the trackway of them were one came in from this direction, and then the other two came in from the south, further, further west. And then they they eventually, if she would have kept if she would have kept watching the one, then she would have she would have seen where the other three the other two met up with them and then she would have seen the family unit and, wow uh, yeah it was an intense it was an intense investigation that we did and, and that was basically really my my first one interview and doing doing uh, something with somebody else as well wow so had you already had a bigfoot sighting yourself when when you had this this report and investigated this Yes, I, I I knew these three because I found these three in the same area working in the wintertime. And it was about three feet of snow. And we were walking into this one drainage, which was about a mile from the truck. And then I had somebody else working with me. And, and that's what we like to do. We, we don't send anybody out alone in the wintertime because we don't want in case of injury or anything. So I walked ahead of them. And I started seeing these huge impressions in the snow. And I was like, oh, somebody else must be out here working. And then as I continued down into the drainage, then the impressions got smaller and they got more detailed. And when I got into the creek, then that's when I, all the toes popped out and I could see what I was looking at. And it was the 22-inch track fella that the lady spotted. It was, I was like... What was it? Three years before that. And then I went and got, grabbed my partner and I said, I want you to look at something. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. This is basically my first really good track with it I've ever found. And I brought him down and he goes, oh, yeah, somebody else is working. I said, you have no idea who's down here. I said, keep coming. It gets better. And then when we get down to the track that I left all my gear by, then he looks down and he goes, you know, didn't say anything, his just mouth just like dropped to the snow. And then I was like, Yeah, that's what I think they are too. And then, then we started working together and following. I followed him as he walked away uh, in the direction that they were going. And then he walked back down into the creek. And then he called me up and he says, Got another track down here. And then it was the 18 inch track. And then we followed the 18 inch track down the creek. And then we found an eight inch track. And <clears throat> what's fascinating is that you could see the personality in each three of these, the male being the, the watcher, the protector of the group as he was up high and then moving. He was moving tree to tree. So when I looked down at his tracks in the snow, you could see his tracks looking on one side of the tree in the direction that he was going and then moving to the next tree. And then looking again and then going into the next tree and then doing the same thing all the way up. And then the other two were just nonchalantly moving along the creek bottom, you know, following the upper one. And you could tell this one down the 18 inch track was the mother because she was watching the little one. And the little guy, he ran up all over the place. He was up there on the hillside and then he would come back down 
meet up with her and they would walk and then he would go back up again and do meander all over the place and then as i follow his trackway there was this log that was probably about two and a half feet tall and it had a tree across over the top of it and you could see in the snow as he walked up that tree and looked like he had bounced up and down on it and then he jumped off of it because there was no tracks below it and then he jumped off of it and then he started meandering down to the mall and we spent like about through almost three hours looking at all these tracks and everything and then finally just like it got darker and then it got creepier and it was like it's time to go and uh, so oh, yeah i i found i i I knew the group that was up at the um, at the tower that day because I ran into them a couple of years before that. Very cool, very cool. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. I love that story. And and they yeah. don't man that tower anymore. Uh, not uh, not all week. No, they 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 go up and do a ten hour day and then they come back down. But during the heavier part of the season, they don't just send one person. They send like two two now to, to go up in there. Okay. But nobody, no, nobody will spend the night up there anymore. <laughs> I, I wonder if she would be willing to do it if they would let her. I'm sure people would would do it, but uh, you know, maybe as a hey, I, I triple dog dare you to go up and spend the night up at the, the <laughs> you know. <laughs> Absolutely, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Mm. I would stay there. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I've I've been up there a couple of nights, and uh, you. I mean, you've got like I said, about thirty. You can see all the way down into Oregon from from up there, and then Mount Rainier, and uh, uh, so yeah, you can see a good distance, and then you can hear things and see things because it's not timbered all the way around it. It's just um, it's timbered on one side. So the direction that these these th this family unit came from was from the south, and they they walked through an open uh, brushy area in order to get to the cab. But if you had if you were comfortable enough with night vision and thermal, oh yeah, no problem. I would love that. That would be awesome. I would totally stay yeah, there. So you guys come up uh, uh, later this later uh, this year, you know. I'll get the permits and then we'll we'll go on up. Can we stay there? Uh, I don't see why not. No, as long as uh, as long as you're not hunting and not gathering, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine with not hunting or gathering, we're good. <laughs> that would be so incredible! I can't wait. I got to tell you, the she squatchers and my team is just really excited to come out there to mm -hmm. the Yakima Nation in April for your Bigfoot conference. Maybe, would you like to tell everybody about that? Yes, yes. Um, in April uh, 18th is the main day. It's going to be a one day, but uh, the 17th is, I think, I believe a Friday. Um, it's going to be like a meet and greet. Uh, the Yakima Nation uh, Legends Casino has uh, partnered with the Yakima County um, Tourism, and they're going to put on a Bigfoot conference. There's still in the works about uh, getting everything um, hammered out and, and set uh, set in stone but uh, the she squatchers have been invited to come along and then there are a couple of other folks that we are working on uh, getting to attend uh, they asked me to be the master of ceremonies and I uh, I don't know I, I, I could probably do it I've never done anything like it I mean I've done presentations and everything and I will also be doing a presentation there but what's unique about this is that the female perspective on this, all you all you see on television is male, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, we're going to go up on Bigfoot. And um, and then, of course, they, they, they allow the, the female to tag along. Uh, but what's great about this is that the, the committee has been all female and the attention, the detail of how they think that things should be you know, presented to, to, for the whole family, not just, not just a, the, you know, the dad, the uncle, the grandpa, you know, and uh, so they got wine tours and, you know, all the family, they also, in the, um, one of the uh, partitions is going to be a, a kid area so that somebody will be working with the children 
with exercises and everything else related to kind of like Bigfoot. Because I, I've heard the term Bigfoot yoga, but it's just a, a person who's just going to be working and exercising with the kid. So there's going to be activity for for the whole the whole family. And um, so um, what also what they also came up with is um, the, the they they don't want to be it um, driven by presenters. They want, and this is where I came in. They wanted me to collect um, witnesses from around the Yakima Reservation, so that they could come up and tell their stories. But when you try to do that with people that don't talk, then that you know they they they'll freeze up. So we're going to do an like a, a sit down interview process like we're doing here where we're two of us are going to be sitting across from them on stage the audience out there and we're going to be talking to them and getting them to loosen up and everything and then get that raw emotion out of them you know the, the fear and everything else so when people that have actual encounters you can see that they you know through through the way they talk they, they've gone through things and so that's what's kind of unique about this uh this approach that they've come up with very cool. I'm so excited to come out there. I am so excited to come out there. I, I, I know that you've been recently filmed for a documentary that's coming out called Native Bigfoot uh, yes. by Bill Cole Productions. Uh, she Squatchers was in their first film about Bigfoot, which was Cultured Bigfoot. And mm -hmm. um, what was really neat when I talked to Bill about I said, when is it coming out? Because out of your three Bigfoot films, this is the one I'm really excited to see. This is the one I really want to see. And, and what nations, what Native nations did you talk to? Because um, I already knew a couple of the guys that he interviewed. Uh, I didn't know that you had been interviewed. And I was going to say to him, uh, you know, I, I, I told him, I said, I met this, this Native man out in Washington, and he has the greatest stories. You, he should be on your film. And come to find out, he already had interviewed you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to meet them over the summer, and what a, what a great couple they are. And yeah. uh, they brought their dog with them, and so there was limited that uh, she could do because she decided to stay. And uh, But I, I did take Bill out, out to the reservation, and uh, we, we really loved it. Took him, he brought his drone with him, and uh, so he did some, some flights over the Klickitat River. And uh, I, I hope it comes out good. I've seen the pictures, but I haven't seen the video yet. Well, he told me that he has never felt more that Bigfoot was just behind the trees ever before. He just felt like Bigfoot was all around when he was mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. So I, yeah. that made me more excited to come out there. <laughs> yeah, I've, the area that I took him to was right behind the, the Signal Peak area. And there's a lot of activity that we get in, in this particular area. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I, I know he said that he thinks the film is coming out and it's going to be available in January. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And I was really excited to hear that you were in that as well. I, I know Baldemar from Texas and Alan Yerksa from Canada. He's actually in Ojibwe from, uh, from our tribe, but he's from a different reservation in Canada. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so I was really excited that, that they were interviewed and maybe I'll see some other familiar faces on the show. Yeah. Um, he wanted me to, uh, gather up a couple of folks to, uh, you know, for, for the documentary. And then I could only think of one and that uh, was, she's my aunt and, uh, she, he, he kind of wanted somebody that spoke the, uh, the, uh, the Sapton Yakima language. And so she was the one that I knew close to me that would do it and then knew the language as well. And uh, he, he, he enjoyed her a lot. Very and then cool. the other folks that I, I thought of, it was, that was like my fourth project that I had done that year. And so uh, the other one was a Canadian uh, Aboriginal People's Network from Canada and uh, that one was called Red Earth Uncovered. And we did that one in January during one of our worst snow days ever. And they wanted they wanted to do it outside. And I was like, you guys are crazy. And he's like, oh, no, we're Canadians. We're used to being outside. <laughs> 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 true. So, 
Yeah. So we did the interview, and it was almost, it was right around two hours we were outside, and boy, there were some cold, cold, cold people at the end of that. And so I didn't want to reuse the same people, in, you know, in, in the um, other documentary. So I was trying to find people that wanted to do other things. And uh, so I only had one for them when Bill showed up. I hear you. I hear you. That sounds, that sounds fun. I would love to get, is, if that other documentary is available, I'd love to get the link for it so I could see it. Yeah, yeah. He, he gifted me the two uh, the other two, and I haven't, I haven't been able to watch them yet. So okay. now I will, since the third one is coming out. Yes, yes. Well, I'd love to see, see the, the Canadian film that you, that you filmed for yeah, yeah. If you go to um, Red, uh, into Google and type in "Red Earth Uncovered," what's unique about this is is that it's the native perspective, and it's 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 based on uh, a young gal who's listening to her grandfather type telling her these stories and where to go to find her answers, and so she she sets out on these adventures that she hears from him, and then. Then she comes back and tells the story to her grandfather of uh, what she what she found out. And what's cool about this is, is that the main the main person that they're focusing on they do sand art, and so the person doing the sand art as the story is being told is, is fascinating. It's, wow, that is so cool! But if you get a chance, Red Earth Uncovered, just season one, um, and uh, you'll see. I, I'm I'm excited to see that. I really am. I love the native the native perspective on all these things. So I I'll just drink that up. I tell you, season one. Okay, gotcha. I got it written down, so I'm going to check that out later. Okay. All right. Well, I think that sounds good for this recording. I'm going to stop recording real quick, and we're going to start another one. So thanks thanks so much for everything, Mel. Oh, oh, thank you.